How's it going everybody? Eulier Gonzalez here uh, and in today we're going to take a look at the hard part of asynchronous JavaScript. This is a course taught by Will Sentence. Uh, he was the creator of ISCO which is uh, one of the most popular platforms uh, on P2P and data sharing uh, and now he is the CEO of Codesmith, a software engineering and machine learning residency. So with that background, the whole goal of looking at this series of videos is to understand and be able to describe what are the fundamentals and the mechanism involved in, a in JavaScript uh, when it comes to do these async operations. So as part of a senior developer or as a senior software engineer, it is also important to improve your soft skills. So how well are you to communicate your ideas? Do you know the trade-off uh, or do you memorize that? How is your thinking process? And well, how is your coding solutions? So with that, uh, we're gonna take a look at the this course and from that I'm gonna take is just notes out of that. Uh, so you won't be able to see what I'm doing. And so in today's video, we're gonna look at not only the goal of this course, uh, to write it down here, as well as the specific goals and the code structure, okay? As a way to now have this mental model. It also is important to know when this course was launched, okay? Or was published. Then there you get is this. Yeah, it was published here. Uh, published this date, uh, start date, exactly start date, uh, four July. Let me, let me put it here. Four June, June four, twenty twenty four. Uh, unexpected and is with within the next fifteen days, uh, or ten business day. All right. Here we go. Smith, Coach Smith, LA. We just left this office for a beautiful new office in Venice Beach, in the heart of Venice Beach, underneath the Venice sign. I don't know if anyone knows that place, but it is nice. There's me with my very talented sisters, all of whom, actually, Ursi, the one on the far right there, has just started her finals at Oxford. Often they don't do a model where you uh, do uh, intermediate exams that form your final grade. Your final grade is instead produced by two weeks of exams at the end of the entire program. Meaning you can do whatever you want until those final two weeks. And in those final two weeks, oh my goodness, it is the worst two weeks. I remember three nights in a row getting two hours sleep before my papers. Oh, anyway, there you go, wonderful sisters. I used to work at uh, ISCON, it was a popular web RTC library, and then GEM, which is a blockchain company that's done every possible thing in the blockchain crypto space. Very, very cool company, excellent leadership, very nice company. All right, I run Codesmith. Uh, very briefly, what is Codesmith? First and foremost, by the way, a center of software engineering excellence. I can't stress enough. Yes, Codesmith, in the end, produces uh, people with the skills to go and build the things they dream up, to go and work in the companies they dream to work at. But that is not the purpose, and that speaks to everything we're gonna to do today. The goal of becoming a great engineer is to have the ability to build. As a side effect of that. Exactly, exactly. So the goal from this course uh, and the goal uh, as a software engineer is the ability to build, period. We get this unique opportunity to work in roles that are intellectually satisfying, create. Mm -hmm. And as a side effect of this, okay, we got incredible opportunities to work in very intellectual intellectual satis satisfying companies and I guess you know stable financially fulfilling I don't think it's ever existed before As Creative and financially um, 
sustainable, man. That are intellectually satisfying, creative, and I guess, you know, stable, financially fulfilling. And financially stable. Sort of speaking. I don't think it's ever existed before. And it's a great, great privilege to have that. So that's what Chosen produces. Brad's work at Google, Amazon, PayPal, Microsoft, Oscar, create all these sort of companies. Uh, only a quarter get senior positions, most get mid-level engineering positions. By the way, the kind of material we're seeing today is the kind of material that grads get asked interview questions on the entire time. We surveyed grads actually a few weeks ago, what's the thing you get asked about most? Number one, event loop. How is it working? For mid-senior jobs, number one question. Mm -hmm. Number two, closure. How is it working under the hood? Now, half past part one has a detailed breakout of closure. We're not going to go through in the same level of detail, but by the way, as a preview, for us to understand iterators, we're gonna to need to deeply understand closure. All right, uh, what is that to say? Oh, I will say this bit in the middle. It is special for me that every person in this room, we are independent, agnostic to your background. And the same thing goes at Coatsmith. You have the Princeton CS grad learning alongside the person who didn't go to college. And that's again the beautiful thing about software engineering. Uh, we always talk at the end of the program, the only feedback you get in interviews is not enough experience. Everyone's favorite, but that's the most empowering piece of feedback on earth. This is the only industry where not enough experience is really, we ask you 10 questions and you can only answer four of them well, go fill in the six over the next few days. And that's why in the end being an engineer is the ability to break through blocks in your understanding. And what an incredibly empowering industry that is, where you can go from not having enough experience to just three days later having enough experience because you've broken through those blocks. And that is the essence of the coaching. Right, good. Oh, the team that makes coaching possible. These very, very, very nice people. Ah, oh. shout out to Eric, whose movie, he has a side project, a movie called Midnight Sun aimed at a young adult audience, had a $10 million budget, broke $25 million globally. Isn't that incredible? He's now close friends with Justin Bieber, who was at the premiere at the But nevertheless, I think he does, he may have the Biebs number, I'm not sure. Uh, but this is a wonderful collection of people who make coach with LA and New York, two locations, uh, happen. Wonderful, wonderful people. Snow there, who runs technical in LA, 20 years experience. Anyway, wonderful people, good. By the way, the things we look for in coach with candidates, just if you're interested, but I will say more significantly to everybody else, the things that companies look for in their own engineering hands, not junior dev, not entry level, but mid or senior, that is the ability to take any new feature and implement it. But what does that require? Problem solving. That is a fundamental thing. Can I break through a block? Notice, fifth most important is your knowledge of the language or framework. Those things, they evolve. Our friend James, he already commented, the front end frameworks, they evolve. There's a new, Rishi, is that a word? I made a word up. Is that a word? Is that a word? Sure. There's a new bougie framework, that's not the word I'm looking for. Rishi, 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 I'm sure it's a word. There's a new, someone online is going, yes, that's a word. I haven't heard that word for 17 years, 17 years. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty much like that. It's the five ca uh, capacity we're looking for in candidate. Um, this is not go more for like, again, uh, let me put it this way. Uh, companies, um, or, Mm, uh, let me, mm, mm, companies request okay or industry because that's all is that is industry industry in what are, what are what are industry are looking for what are what what skills industry what skill companies are looking for yep what skills company are looking for is that your problem analytical solving your analytical and then exactly analytical skill okay how's your thought process how is you're going through solve a problem analytical skills uh, technical communication okay technical uh, communication can I can I implement your solution okay exactly can I implement your approach mm -hmm. can I implement your approach 
from your explanation, uh, from from your explanation. <clears throat> okay. Uh, engineering best practice and approaches. Uh, this is what engineering best practice and approaches. Uh, engine engineering best practices. So coding, reading documentation, patience, uh, which is now soft skills. Okay, very 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 important. Uh, empathetic and thoughtful communication, then language and computer science experience. And then language uh, and computer science experience, you know. Again, it's going to depend vastly. This is in the case of the United States. Uh, but here in Latin is quite different. Hey, can you fill all of these boxes? If it is, great. And again, here, um, a few people are going to give you the opportunity because, after all, this is what the market it is all about. Why do I have to give you the opportunity? And again, this is something that is problematic, uh, and that's when the government enters here and say, hey, you should provide the opportunity to this company, blah, 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 blah. But from the company perspective, it's like, hey, if I do that, I'm gonna, and since we are now on the market, competing on the market with other companies, if we allow this to happen, then uh, we're gonna reduce our competitive advantage, one. And second, uh, we might lose our business, or we might be, or we might be acquired by another company. So, there is a here. There is some multi-factor variable here. Um, that at the end of the day, uh, the only thing that I, the, the only thing that I can tell, for sure, is that as a person, try to identify something that you have experienced, you like, you have interest, uh, that people are willing to pay for that. And then over delivery on uh, um, providing value to that. So the idea here is that no matter which industry is, or in this context on the software, is that focus on your skills, focus on being good at that, and then the opportunity will come up. That's one of the reasons why improving your value is something important and, and not. And not in the technical aspect, not in the professional aspect, but also in your personal life. Because money is a social activity. You only go far with others. Anyway. <laughs> so um, here we are, right? This is what our this is what skills companies are looking for. Something that are quite familiar, analytical, your uh, how good are your solving problems. Uh, your coding uh, or your engineering best practice, hey, your coding, reading documentation, uh, your patience, um, your technical communications, very, very, very important, is like everything that you know, did you memorize or did you know the trade of? And also, based on your approach, uh, can I implement uh, or can I implement your approach from your uh, explanation? The other is soft skills, which is empathy, that kind of thing. And lastly, is language and computer science experience. This is again for companies in the States. But in any case, that's what I advocate vastly to uh, improve your value. Uh, so move on. New uh, on-trend framework every year. 
That's not what makes a great engineer. You're a technician in that case. You're an angular technician. Mm -hmm. You're inflexible. What makes a great engineer, by the way, what we look for in coding with candidates, is your ability to break through your blocks. We're going to do that today. And your technical communication. When I call on every single person in this room today to talk through your code, what we're doing is refining our technical communication. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing. And then best practice and approach and your non-technical communication. And even here, the expectation is supporting each other. This is not an environment to show off, but rather an environment to embrace the growth of those around you, which is a wonderful context in which to grow your own self. Here we are, hard parts of JavaScript. The foundations we have to understand, though, to get to the hard parts are going to feel at times a little bit trite, a little bit trivial. And for folks who've been to hard parts before, you're even going to feel, hold on, I've seen this stuff before. Our first about 30 minutes or so is going to be material that if you've been to hard parts before, you'll recognize. Because that is the JavaScript engine and how mm -hmm. it works. It's a universal. But we've got to lay these foundations out. And by the way, you're going to see code, you're going to go, yeah, yeah, thanks. I get how this code is running. I get what it's doing. But we're going to see it, and it's going to empower us to then solve all the hard parts to come. All right. Let's go. Here it is. We're going to whiteboard through all of our code's execution just as the JavaScript engine runs it. We do that. There can be no gaps in our yeah, understanding. We're going to set through like line by line. And we're going to map it up on the whiteboard the whole time. So with that in mind, what happens when JavaScript executes runs my code? There's two halves. I'll tell you straight away. There's two halves to the process of executing code. One is literally the ability, the ability to walk through, through, the code line, through the code line by line. By line. By line. That mm -hmm. is known as the thread of execution. Mm -hmm. JavaScript fundamental. So uh, we got is the threads of execution. Mm -hmm. The ability to walk, yeah, to walk uh, through our code line by line. Okay. So that's one of the fundamental of the JavaScript. The thread of execution and the ability to store data in our memory. And all that is is the, the, the processing ability to take line one, do it, whatever it says to do. Take line two, do it, whatever it says to do. Take line three, do it, whatever it says to do. It's executing, doing the code. Memory. It's threading its way down our code. By the way, in order, top to bottom. Simultaneously, the other part that's required to run our code is a place to store the bits of data mm -hmm. that we announce as we go through our life memory of variable. In line one, we're announcing that we're going to store a place to store the bits With of data, data that we announce as we go through our code execution. So you can see in line one, we're announcing this is known as global we're going to store environment none as the label for some data three. This so we're going to map these on the AKA whiteboard. Which will be a fascinating experience. Let's see how it goes. Global line by line. Starting with line one. I'm going to call on Paul. Global execution context. In line one. What are we actually doing? saying allocate some data to the global uh, to a constant called num and then toss an integer three onto that. Well, that seems like a very intuitive description. So we are in our memory. Is a global variable environment. In our memory, global we are declaring constant. Just remember that means variable. a piece of data where we're not allowed to change its position in memory. So we can't suddenly replace num's value. With yeah, and I think this is in the running of our application. Num is set to yeah. the value three. Excellent. Michelle, what does that next line of code here say to do? Um, the next line of code is also creating um, something in memory that we're calling. All right, we're being very precise. This is <laughs> Go on. What is it called? Call multiply by two, excellent. Call ne uh, named multiply by two. Something in memory that we're calling. All right, we're being very precise. This is. <laughs> oh, what is our next line of code here saying to do? Um, the next line of code is also creating um, something in memory that we're calling. All right, we're being very precise. This is. <laughs> Go on. What is it called? Call cool multiply by two, excellent. Call ne uh, named multiply by two. We're declaring the function multiply by two, and folks. In JavaScript functions, that means the entire functionality is are assigned as values. Just like the number three, we're storing in memory the functionality, the function definition of multiply by two. I'm not going to write yeah, this is part of the JavaScript right fundamentals. Instead, I'm going to represent it with this little box with an F in. That represents my entire yeah, function yeah. definition. If I do in my console now log multiply by two, what would I see, James? Uh, you would see the, the actual uh, source code for yeah, the exactly. Function. I'd see the block of code itself function multiplied by two, you know, I'd see the whole thing with the code in my console. That is what we mean when we say declare a function. We are literally, sometimes we think, oh, we're just sort of going, oh, there's a function in code. No, no. The keyword function literally means go save in memory, go save in memory this particular functionality. All right, excellent. What's our third line of code that executes Sean? It's uh, doing the same thing as our first constant declaration, creating a 
Yep. Piece of memory called name. Excellent. Sean, what was not our third line of code? Nice result. Right, why not? Because there's that being called yet. Exactly. We do not go into the body of a function until what, Sean? Until it's called. Until it's called. Excellent. All right. Sean is spot on there. And folks, this may seem profoundly trivial. Trivial. Right? Okay, I get how to store stuff in memory. But this foundation is what we need. This level of precision is absolutely vital for everything that follows, all the way up to rebuilding async await with generators. It all, in the end, depends on these foundations. All right, excellent. So as soon as we start running our code, we spin up two things. One, the ability to go through our code line by line. That's the threat of execution, threading exactly. Threading through and executing the code exactly. line by line. And, and then we got a memory. We spin up, uh, we spin up code line by line. A line mm. memory of variables with data, a live store of labels with data. Posh name for that is a variable environment. We can call this a, a variable environment. Think of it as being environment is the things around me. These are the variables around me, the variable environment. Now, these two halves together are known. These two halves together, the thread of it, we're going to walk through. We didn't copy out the lines in the thread, there's no point. But these two halves together are known as an execution Ex context. context. That is a, a context is a space to do something, a space, a context in which we do something, or it's a space in which we execute our code. Ex execution. Context. Oh my god, no, what a single moment. Okay. Mm, you think you're funny? Okay. Exactly. So, uh, execution, execution context is made of a thread of execution in live memory. Something, something, something that is, yeah. Execution context is made of a thread of execution in live memory. Something that is created every time we run the body of a function. It's an execution context. And it's the global one, because we're going to discover whenever we want to run code, including, for example, when we want to execute the code inside a function, we're going to create a little baby local execution context just for running the code inside a mm -hmm. function. We call it the local one, just for the stuff inside a function. But this, though, is for our overall code. It's called the global execution. Exactly. Uh, we we'll run the body of a function. Global execution context is that is that is what we get. Okay. When we run our JavaScript JavaScript code. <clears throat> just for running the code inside a function. We call it the local one, just for the stuff inside a function. But this, though, is for our overall code. It's called the... Because for our overall call code. So global execution is what we get when we run our, our overall JavaScript code, okay? Or entire JavaScript, overall uh, JavaScript code. Global execution context. All right, people, let's see what's next. All right. As Sean rightly said, we did not execute, we did not call, we did not invoke multiply by two. So we stayed in which execution context, Sean? Global. Global, excellent. But now we are going to execute a function and see what happens. So we've declared num is three, declared multiply by two as a function. What is our next line of code? Mr. Henderson, what is our next line of code, Brian? We are creating a do label in memory called output. Excellent. Do we know what to assign to it yet? Undefined. Very good. Because What's the right hand side? Is the right hand side a value that we can store? Uh, no, it's calling the execution of. Exactly, it's command to go and do something. It's actually not a value we can store on the right hand side. Output has zero interest in multiply by two. That is a command to go and run some code, whatever gets returned out, known as the, what, Brian? What's, what, what's a generic name for what gets returned out of a function? The, uh, the return value. The return value, return. exactly. Quite literal. The returned value. That's what's going to be assigned to output. All right. But I think it is Let's worth starting off. Do it. So output is going to be the the result, the return Let's value. Let's briefly analyze this multiply by two with the input of four. Let's go to, there we go. So, what did I say we create whenever we have code we have execute? Our blessing? 
Look at his execution context. An execution context. That's a, I'm going to represent that. This is a big old box with two parts. I'm going to represent that with a little box with two parts. Here it is. And we're taking this slowly because these are genuinely so the next we are going to cover a see the three pieces of synchronous JavaScript execution. If we don't get these pieces down, nothing else follows. So into this execution context we go. And just like our global one for running the main code, now with then the, we get code, is the just whole stack. Two, we're going to have a little memory just for the code, that, just for the things that get announced, get declared, the variables and functions and parameters and arguments that get declared inside of multiplied by two's body. They're just going to be stored in here. By the way, when this function finishes executing, all those pieces, unless they're returned out, will be deleted. Let's just talk about this execution garbage collected. It's stuff that we can't access again. We can't reference those names again. So it's garbage. It's memory that's being wasted. So we're going to automatically clean it out in JavaScript. OK, except in one special condition, which we'll see a little bit later on. Because my favorite thing in JavaScript, those times when all our data is not necessarily deleted when we execute a function. The most beautiful concept in JavaScript. And even though we're not going to go through it as the focal point, inevitably, we have to come to it in iterators. OK, good. So in we go. And what is the first thing, Rick, inside our local execution context that we're going to do? Defining a constant variable called result. So that's our second thing, Rick. What's the very first thing we put in our local memory? Uh, the function. Not the function, Michelle. The input number. Exactly. Input number, which is known as our parameter. Remember the, the placeholder. We defined a function, which is to say, we will run this thing later on. When you run me, better make sure you fill in that, bl that blank, that placeholder input number, with an argument. Parameter is the placeholder. Argument is the actual value that gets passed in. Michelle, what's our argument? Our argument is 4. 4, excellent. And so the result is 8. And the final line of the body of the function says to do what, Josh? Uh, to return 8. To return 8. I like that. Return the value of result 8. It's not returning result. It returns the value of result, which is the number 8. I don't like saying return result. It kind of implies the whole thing. It's JavaScript sees return result and goes, huh, what's result? 8. OK, perfect. Return it out to where? Uh, what's going to do? Brady. Brady, sorry, Brady. Uh, Brady, return out to where? To to the globe, but to which execution context? Global. The global, exactly. Return out, return out eight into the global execution context, where it's stored in output. Perfect. So I know this may seem procedural, but I know you can see this and go, yeah, yeah. Well, I get that output's going to be eight. I got that. But we need to have this precision. So now, notice by the way that we weren't allowed to move on to the next line in global, declaring new output, until we'd finished running, multiply by two with input of four. Our thread of execution, the ability to go through the code line by line, it uh, wait, wended its way in to the call of multiplied by two, where it spent time going through the code line by line, and then hit what keyword to exit? What keyword Mike said to exit? Return. And if there's no return statement there, the closing curly brace, which implies an implicit return, so an insert return for us, and out we return. In other words, JavaScript, how many things can it do at a time? One, its thread is singular. It's not going to continue down in global code while simultaneously running multiple pieces. It's almost to say, OK, let's, let's keep going down here and continue here simultaneously. Ah, one of the beautiful things about JavaScript is it's so predictable because it's always one thing after another in order top to bottom, at least in its core synchronous nature. We'll see when that doesn't apply, of course. Uh, so JavaScript is synchronous in order top to bottom and single-threaded. We can't suddenly do two things at the same time. Excellent. So now we do return out to the global execution context where we encounter the, all right, and then result will be synchronous JavaScript model. We have our memory, posh name, variable environment. We have our thread of execution, the ability to go through the code line by line. Mm -hmm. These together are known as an execution context. context. The two things we need to execute code. The context in which we need that is generated. We need to code. That is generated by function. But we've got a whole function. bunch of execution context being created, deleted, created, and then we run another function inside of that one. So another little mini one being created inside of there. Keeping track of those, to us, is visually easy. I finished calling multiply by two. I come out of it, and I'm back where I was before when I started calling multiply by two. We can visually see that very easily. The call set. JavaScript doesn't have that same ability to visually see. That allows I to previously, I called this function in global, track. and that I was in the big box when I moved into the little box. When I finish in the little box, I go back out of the big box. JavaScript doesn't have that ability. It needs to keep track of where it is in the code right now, mm -hmm. where it was when it, before it started being inside this function. OK. Call stack allows to keep track where we are where we are in the where we are at which line exactly to keep track at which line we are in the code um, before running a function where it's going to go back to when it finishes inside this function what is this a knowledge thing does anyone know what data we can store all that sort of information in any format 
there's a particularly nice structure, way of structuring data that will store that information very cleanly. Anyone know what that's? So I want to be able to grab an element at any random position. That's not reflective of what we want to do here. Here, we want to say, just like a stack of plates, I put the first one in, I start off in the global execution context. That's my first element in my stack. And then when I start running multiply by two, I add it on top. And that's like adding my next plate. If I had to run another function inside of that, the last hmm. the call, but as soon as we start running our code, we're running global. So starting off with global as soon as we start running our code. When we start running multiply by two, Paul, what would it make sense to do to our call stack? So this is part of the introduction as a way to uh, look at what are the fundamentals of JavaScript, especially first is the, and also to create the narrative here, because we are a creature that makes sense of the world through narrative, through history, through stories. So first, we got the thread of execution. This, this is the ability to write code line by line and execute code line by line, code thread of execution. But also we have the ability to store data, and that's where we can do that on something called variable environment or global variable uh, environment. So because as we as we write lines of code, we can also create functions, which is the combination of the thread of execution and the variables, in the environment environment. We call that is. Uh, execution context, you know, which is anytime you run a function, you say, okay, this is the information that I'm going to provide you, JavaScript, as a way to analyze what's going on. Line by line, look at the code line by line, thread of, thread of execution, and look at the memory that have inside of this uh, little baby function, which is the execution context, or also known as function execution context. But we also have is a global execution context that is run, uh, or is this code th uh, that is present anytime we run overall JavaScript code, okay? However, because now we can define all of these tiny little set of instructions, aka functions, uh, we need to find a way of how can we know at which line of code we are. Why is that? Because if you can imagine you can have a function inside of another function that returns another function that also can return another function and so on and so on, right? So we need to find a way to know which line we are in the code before running the code and then know what is what this code returns so that's what we have that's what we have here is something called the call stack that allows us to keep track of which line of code we are currently at and when you find a new function you're going to add that to the top and once you run that uh, function you pop up out of the call stack. So all of these things is because are things that are needed or the fundamentals that are needed as a way to provide us this ability to tell a couple of atoms to do something for us, to organize data or to do a series of steps for us. That's quite compelling and that's quite powerful, by the way. I must admit. <laughs> add on the new execution context exactly, add on the call to multiply by two with the input of four. Meaning, while I am in my multiply by two function, my thread is in my multiply by two function, multiply by two is going to be top of my stack of calls. My one simple rule is whatever's top of my call stack, that's where I am right now. And then as soon as I return out, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Yep. So wherever, wherever I am, I am in my call stack. That's that's where I am. That's where I am. Whatever, whatever, where I am in the call stack. That's where I am 
in code. In the case of yeah, Yahoo. So my pool stack multiplied by two, that execution context disappears, you go back to the global, and then Excellent. I'm gonna get rid of multiply by two off my pool stack, and we may know, therefore, return out to global execution context and output, but JavaScript doesn't. JavaScript knows that because look, what's off my pool stack now? Don't panic, it's global, I'm back out to global. This allows JavaScript to keep track of where is it in its code, or what line is running, and then when I finish in the current execution context, where am I gonna return back to? Well, it's get rid of where I was, and the next layer down is where I'm returning back to. All right. Uh, oh, by the way, posh name for adding to a stack is not to add, is not to throw on, is to what, Sean? Victor, what's the posh push. name to add to a stack? Anyone know? Push. push. That's a computer science technical term for adding to a stack. And what's the posh name, Josh, you know, for getting something off the stack? Uh, pop. pop, exactly, push and pop. Excellent, all right, good. Yeah, we talked about this. So let's have thumbs on these core foundations. Thumbs is a, a widely used pedagogical technique to indicate one's understanding. You lost me, I'm very clear. I have a clarification question. Everybody thumbs out right now. It's okay to have clarifications. Nobody. Hmm, very, very frustrating. All right, good, good. Okay, so now that I know these fundamentals and also understand to, and also the ability to describe is what these JavaScript fundamentals are in a storytelling way, okay? Which is part of the reason why I'm doing this. Okay. Anytime you look at the code, and anytime comes a, a client with some of their problems on JavaScript, particularly, uh, I can now say, okay, this is what we need to do. Okay. Well, let me take a look at the code. So what's going on here? That kind of thing, uh, as a way to diagnose things. So that's very, very powerful, and also to improve your communication skills. Very, very. Uh, sought after, especially for uh, people out there, uh, and how important it is to improve your writing, speaking, and reading ability more than before. And especially if you want to provide value to your clients uh, so they can now improve their business. So uh, a couple of things here. First, uh, we looked at the goal of today course, or the goal of this course is to give the ability of software engineering to build things. And we have now this incredible opportunity to uh, work in a very, exactly, to work in a very intellectually satisfying companies, creative and financially stable. So, uh, Again, the goal of this particular course is to look at what companies are looking for, also understand why is that, because pretty much it's like when you go out to a dinner to on a date, okay? And from there, uh, recognize that, well, uh, it's, all, it's important your analytical skills, your technical skills so based on your approach or can I implement your approach based on your explanation I think this is quite quite hard by a lot of people especially on English uh, but it's okay and, and also uh, the engineering practice how good are your coding reading documentation you got patience your soft skills and lastly is your knowledge about the language and uh, your computer science. Uh, it's gonna depend, as, as I mentioned before, it's gonna depend vastly on <clears throat> um, the geography. Uh, it's gonna depend vastly on your geography. Again, all of these topics are very, very important to develop, but at the end of the day, <clears throat> Uh, you must know what you're talking about and be able to communicate those ideas and to solve those problems. So, as I mentioned before, the goal of this course is to now uh, look at the async nature of JavaScript to become not only a soft after uh, engineering, but also someone that can have the ability to build because at the end of the day, that's exactly what is being an engineering. 
whatever feel it is. It's the ability to build something. Okay, so uh, this core structure is on the introduction, the JavaScript fundamentals, as a way to recap uh, how, what are the JavaScript is doing behind the scenes. And remember that after all, JavaScript, what it's doing is executing your code line by line, known as the threat of execution. And it also have the ability to store data uh, in a variable environment. Uh, and also the global environment variable, okay? Uh, which is something that is executed uh, anytime you run your a JavaScript code. So because the combination of the threat of execution, this the ability to read line by line in the variable environment uh, can be run is on a small, tiny set of instructions or aka as functions okay they call that as their own function execution context so where they hold is the threat of, threat of execution as well as the variable environment so because now javascript allowed this okay to write this line by line uh, code store data and also have this little small set of instructions self-contained known as functions where inside of that you can have your own variable environment and your threat of execution and they call that the function execution context so because you can define several function execution contexts you can pretty imagine that um, what will happen if inside of your little set of instructions you return another function and inside of that function you return another function so how can we know at which line of code are we are currently at while we're running our code that's where we have this thing called the call stack that allows to keep track at which line of the code we are before running a function and then run and then execute the function pop out uh, from the call stack and go with the next uh, thing that is on the call stack. So the call stack is indicating that where I am, so whatever is on the call stack is indicating is where I am uh, in the code. That's what it's all about here. So that little introduction about the fundamentals of JavaScript is something quite, quite compelling, completely. We're going to move on to now the wonderful world of asynchronicity. Asynchronicity is going to change up this whole model. It's not going to change it up. It's going to augment this whole model. This whole. Okay. Asynchronous JavaScript. Uh, asynchro. Asyn asynchronicity will augment asyn asynchronous exactly asynchronicity will augment the JavaScript fundamental model. All model is going to continue to exist. In fact. The reason we're going to need to augment our model is this model is going to be fundamentally untenable in how we think about doing tasks that take a long time. So let's just confirm. JavaScript is. And, and that is because, and that is because this model is not tenable, tenable is untenable not able to defend uh, okay untenable 
untenable, not able to defend, not able to uh, all to be occupied. Synonymous, untenable. Implausible. Implausible. Okay, it's not is is implausible. Okay, or untenant to run tasks. Fundamentally untenable in how we think about doing tasks that take a long time. Mm -hmm. Impossible in terms of doing tasks that takes a long time. Doing tasks uh, that takes long time. Task in plural that takes long time. So let's just confirm. JavaScript is single threaded. One line of mm -hmm. code executing at a time. When I start running multiple by two, I'm not allowed to get. Which means, which means, single thread. Continue on in my global code to executing the next multiple by two at the same time. Not allowed to. Single threaded. But simultaneously, I'm also not allowed to move on to the next line. Regardless, because until I finish multiply by two is cool, because JavaScript is synchronous. Now, what that means is I go from top to bottom, I never move on to the next line until I finish on the previous line. I never, ever move on to the next line. If you see a function call, I must return out of it. I must finish executing it before I hit the next line. Well, this implies a big problem. What if our multiply by two call were a call to a server that was going to take 300 milliseconds? I'm not allowed to move on from that line to run any more JavaScript until that comes back. What if I click view more tweets, it runs JavaScript code that says go get more tweets? It's going to take 300 minutes or 200 milliseconds before the tweets come back. But in the meantime, I'm clicking like on a tweet, which is going to run more JavaScript code to turn it to pink and to increase the number of likes on that tweet in my state, in my memory. That can't happen. I'll be sitting there clicking because I'm still busy waiting on the line saying, go get more tweets. Because I've got to wait till it returns back the tweets, right? Before I can move on to my next line that says, color the heart pink, because I click the button. This is going to be a profound issue. What if we want to wait some time before we can execute certain bits of code? Exactly. But it's because it's unplausible in doing tasks that takes long time. The current JavaScript model, or the, or the fundamental JavaScript model, mm -hmm. what if we need to wait, okay? What if we need to wait sometimes before we can execute a certain bit of code? What if we need to wait some time yeah, what if we need to wait some time before, some time before we can execute, yeah, execute certain bit of code, certain bits of code. We want to wait until our data comes back from Twitter before we can then display and run the functionality display that data. Perhaps we need to get more data from the API or even a timer to complete and then we want to run some code. We have a conundrum, a tension between wanting to delay some code running. A conundrum. <laughs> conundrum. A conundrum. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Because we're waiting for data to come back, so we want to have the next line of code be display those tweets. We've got to have the data to come back, but we do not want to block our single mm. thread from continuing to run code. This is going to be a profound conundrum. It's going to be the essence of why we have to introduce in JavaScript a whole complementary model to our beautiful synchronous world. This, these three parts of JavaScript alone are not enough. What's particularly interesting is asynchronicity in JavaScript, asynchronous world of JavaScript is the interesting stuff. I love our pure, simple JavaScript engine, but everything we love about web application development is not happening in pure JavaScript. Pure JavaScript does not know how to speak to the internet. That is not a feature of JavaScript to speak to the internet. Instead, all those features are sitting outside of JavaScript. They're sitting outside of JavaScript in where? What's name? Alec. Alec, where are they sitting? So because our our code, because our JavaScript JavaScript code most of the time 
works in on the internet on the internet which relies on features okay because our JavaScript code most of the time works on the internet which relies on features outside of that outside of our JavaScript model Where are those features of JavaScript that are not, that are doing things like speaking to the internet? Where are they? Or well, not features of JavaScript, sorry. Where are those features that speak to the internet? Uh, fetch. JavaScript. <clears throat> uh, I don't know, RESTful web services and... Michelle, where are those features that, for example, can speak to the internet? Are they in the browser? They're in the browser. The browser is a wealth of features that we in JavaScript get access to. We write JavaScript code that is a, essentially a facade. We're going to see these are facades for a bunch of features that are not in JavaScript, but instead in the web browser. Mm -hmm. features that live in in the browser or node JavaScript environment that's what we're going to end up spending most of our time this morning doing is writing JavaScript code that interfaces, APIs, very, Alex right. interfaces, the I in API stands for interface, that interacts with stuff outside of JavaScript. Okay, we need a whole new bunch of features in JavaScript and outside of JavaScript in order to understand how this is working. So here we go, here's our first solution. I'm gonna pre tell you that it's fundamentally untenable, but here's our first solution for how to go and do a task that's gonna take a long time, like speaking to Twitter and getting our tweets back, and nevertheless be able to continue running code but know where that data is when it comes back. This first solution here is going to be untenable but it is nevertheless going to be fairly intuitive but completely untenable. All right, line one. And by the way, so far we're still seeing things that are very analogous to first hard parts. But we need to get these foundations down to understand the harder pieces to come. All right, line one. Abdi? Well, we're declaring yeah, very nicely put, Abdi. Display is declared. Excellent. Next line of code, Alec. Do the left-hand side first. Uh, we're declaring uh, data from API. Yeah, and what's it going to be assigned? Uh, the fetch and wait function. No, we never assigned function. If we just had... We are, no, we're not assigning. We actually run it. If we had no parens there, it could be assigned. It would say, well, what's fetch and wait? And it would assign it to that, whatever it is. But JavaScript's not doing that on the right-hand side. What do parens always tell me to do? Blessing. <laughs> to call. The right hand side here is in command. It is unfinished work. So be really clear with yourself. In no way are we assigned. Data API has zero interest in fetch and wait. Its only interest is in whatever gets returned from fetch and wait, which we hope will be our tweet. Okay, so fetch and wait here is a made up function, but let's just see what it does. So data from API is going to be the return of fetch and wait to our Twitter URL. So we're hoping it's going to return a nice tweet for us. That's what we're hoping. So let's start tracking our time passing. We're at about one millisecond here. Let's say this thing here takes 200 milliseconds to complete. 200 milliseconds. Oh. 200 milliseconds later, finally our data comes back. Could be 300 milliseconds, could be half a second. We don't even know. In that time, are we allowed to move on and run any further JavaScript code? Absolutely not. We are not allowed to move on. We are blocked because our JavaScript thread is synchronous. There's work we're still doing on the right hand side here. We're not allowed to move on to the next line. We wouldn't want to. Because the next line says display the data review API. We better have that data back, go to display it. This is that solution one. Be clear, this is not the right solution. But this is a solution. So 200 milliseconds passes and our request to Twitter returns out. Let's just say, let's just say very nicely, it returns out our data and it is the it is a single tweet. And it's not even coming back as an object. Of course, they come back as objects, but just a tweet high. And we go to store high where, Michelle? Uh, in um, data from API. In, in data from API, exactly. I apologize for sounding like I'm correcting all of your pronunciations of data to data, but I am not. I'm breaking. Data from API. In, in even coming back as an object. Of course, they come back as objects, but just a tweet high. And we go to store high where, Michelle? Uh, in um, data from API. In, in data from API, exactly. I apologize for sounding like I'm correcting all of your pronunciations of data to data, but I am not. I embrace your mispronunciations. Okay. I apologize for sounding like I'm correcting all of your pronunciations. Store high where, Michelle? Uh, in um, data from API. In, in data from API, exactly. 
I apologize for sounding like I'm correcting all of your pronunciations of data to data, but I am not. I embrace your mispronunciations. Okay. Well done, all of you, for corrupt, no, not corrupting. Um, good. <laughs> Customizing a beautiful language. All right. Okay, good. So Data API has high, the string high stored in it. 200 milliseconds later. In that time, no further JavaScript code could run. This is absolutely disastrous. But whatever. Now we hit our next line, which is, we haven't called on yet. Sony, what's our next line of code say to do? We will pass that data API to display. Right. So we pass that to, we're calling the display function with our argument being the value of data from API. Remember, everything in JavaScript gets evaluated immediately. Data from API here is a string high. We throw it straight in and we create an execution context to run it, where in the memory, it's really clear here, in the memory, data, the parameter data is set to that argument high, and so we're going to log in our console at about 201 milliseconds, we're going to log high. Okay. And now finally, what line do we hit next? Gentlemen, what's your name? Ben, sorry, Ben. Uh, we're going to log me later. Me later is going to be logged at the much later time of 202 milliseconds. Me later is logged. Raise your hand if you're a huge fan of this solution. I'm a huge fan of this, no, I'm not sure. No, I don't mind the solution. Here's why I don't mind the solution. It, it is profoundly intuitive. Three goals we have. Oh, we have. Three goals we have. Be able to do tasks that take a long time. Slow tasks, like getting data from Twitter. We have to be able to do that. Otherwise, our web app is very, very boring. At best, we can make a hangman game. Very nice hangman game in the command line, but that's the best we can do. Hang game. Hangman game. Hangman, hang, hangman game. Okay. Oh my god. <laughs> hangman game. But we want to be able to continue running our JavaScript code in the meantime. We could not do that here. Look at this. In the meantime, no JavaScript code was allowed to run for 200 milliseconds. When our slow task completes, though, we should be able to run functionality knowing the task is done and data is ready. That's the hard bit. So it turn out every other solution we have, that's a hard bit. In this solution, it's not a hard bit. This solution is effortless. I can see where my data is synchronously in order in memory. I've got no, I've got no issues when my display function is going to run. It ain't going to run literally in my single thread until I've got my data back. I'm dealing only in the synchronous world here, in order, in order top to bottom. That's why we love JavaScript single thread model. That's the, the vision behind it is it's highly predictable and easy to work with as a developer. But obviously, it's fundamentally untenable. Blocks that single JavaScript thread from running any further code while this task completes. Benefits, it's definitely easy to reason about. But it's untenable. So we have to introduce a whole new world of features of JavaScript. These are features that happen outside of our JavaScript. A synchronous web browser's API, which is something that I know that I put it here, like so. A synchronous JavaScript. <coughs> Uh, and here we look at the asynchronous web browser API. Asynchronous web browser API. In our case, here with the browse. So, because the JavaScript model is not uh, or is is unfeasible is is impossible to impossible to do a task that takes long time since the model is great for writing writing and executing uh, synchronous synchronous code line by line we need to rely on other features other features we need to rely on we need to rely on outside feature on outside features that allows to work with that. 
and that's what we have is the web browser api as it's well as the other itself these are features of the web browser javascript is a little feature of the broader web browser the web browser is full of features the dom that's the model of our web page that javascript can interact with to change stuff on the web page it's a sort of representation of the stuff on our page that javascript can write code to interact with to change our web page that's a feature outside of javascript our console is another web browser feature there's a feature outside of javascript our local storage our mm -hmm. The little, that, that database thing in the browser, our ability to speak to the internet, the XHR ability, all of these are not JavaScript features. They're found on MDN as a list of web browser features known, albeit in JavaScript, as web browser APIs. The reason they're known as that in JavaScript is that we use labels for those features from within JavaScript to stimulate, to get started, a web browser feature. And any feature that's not in my own runtime, my own engine, is something I interface with. So we call it an AP interface, API. So we interact outside of JavaScript. So that's why we have these labels that allow us to interact with those features. For example, the document where we can interact with the DOM elements with the DOM, um, <clears throat> the audio, the audio API, the canvas, okay, the canvas, in in our case, in for our case, in for our case, with network requests such as XH, XHR or fetch API. You've got to introduce those to have any chance of solving this three-way conundrum. The only chance you have of solving it is to introduce web browser features or in Node they're known as background threats. All right, or APIs in Node as well. Exactly. Web browsers, API, or no backgrounds here. Web browsers or no DS API. So here we go, people. Line by line, we're going to walk through this. And this solution, I'm going to tell you this solution, everything else is just an augmentation of this solution. I like this solution. But JavaScript designers recognize some failings of this solution. And solution three is going to be our brand new solution. And that is the most popular. But I still think our final solution, at the very end of the day, is the solution that finally is, is particularly nice, I think. And all of these solutions work, including solution two, if you understand how they're working under the hood. So here we go. Line one, Michelle, what are we doing? Um, we're declaring a function in memory called print hello. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Can you say a little bit slower while I continue to wipe down my whiteboard? Uh, we're defining a function in memory called print hello. Print. Mm -hmm. So we're defining this function here in memory called print hello. There we go. That's blessing. Good. All right, excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Excellent. Next line. Talk to me in general terms, Victor. What are we doing in my next line? What are we calling? So we're calling oh, the an API no, called say timeout. We're talking the global execution context um, to use a. Okay, stop trying to be smart. Someone else speaking more abstract terms. Very good, Victor. We're going to come to it in a second. I just want to first, Mike. I think we're actually calling the print hello. Okay, so it just needs to be more abstract. We're calling set timeout with what arguments, Ben? Hello. Yeah, the entire exactly. print hello function definition. Be really clear. When I call a function, what symbol is telling me I'm calling a function here, Ben? Um, the parentheses. Parent, 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 parent. I'm calling set the print hello function definition. Be really clear. When I call a function, what symbol is telling me I'm calling a function here, Ben? Um, the parentheses. Parent, 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 parent. I'm calling set timeout. Do I see any parentheses on the end of print hello? Definitely not. I'm instead passing the entire function definition into set timeout. Who knows what that means? And the second argument, a thousand, which remember, represents the number of milliseconds uh, after which I want this print hello function to call, to be called, to be invoked. So it's going to be auto invoked, kind of beyond my control, probably, right? Somewhere inside, set timeout. Wrong. But let's imagine that's the case. Let's imagine that is the case that somehow, when, when I put parens up on the end of a function call, uh, Brian, what do I create? A new execution context. Execution context. Everything suggests I would. Let's just see what would happen if that were the case. I get it. New execution context. There it is. Into it I go. 
and then plus 1,000 milliseconds. It's going to stay on the call stack for 1,000 milliseconds. Going to be in, we're going to be inside this execution context, at which time I'm then going to, well, JavaScript set timeout's going to call for me, print hello, and I'm going to come back out uh, at about 1,001 milliseconds and hit what line, Michelle? Um, the <laughs> The, con the console log, me first. Okay, 1,001 milliseconds later. I've continued my JavaScript synchronous thread 1,001 milliseconds later. Does this seem likely as how the set timeout works? This would be disastrous. This is absolutely not what set timeout is doing. Set timeout, in fact, does nothing. It is one little thing in JavaScript, but in fact, does nothing of any interest in JavaScript at all. It is instead a facade, a facade function, a facade for functionality happening outside of JavaScript. Where? In what place? JavaScript. The web browser. JavaScript has no timer. JavaScript is not the timer that set timeout's using. We've got to introduce a whole new section to our model app platform for understanding JavaScript runtime that's actually not even in JavaScript. The web browser, let's try and keep this tidy, the web browser features. There it is. Oh, my proudest moment. There it is. Phoenix. Now things started to make sense for me. Ben, look up. There's a beautiful illustration. <laughs> not as good as I thought it was, actually. I'm disappointed with that. Let me try that again. I've been practicing for time. But it's, now it's like a Pokeball or something like that. OK, here we go. Try again. There you go. We've got all of these labels Thanks, that allow us to interact yeah, with like, this like, notion. Bits to but it. what yeah, I need to know is the, the, the word. That's a joke. I need to know the word. That's a joke. Big fan. Big fan of Firefox. Ever since no, 2010. Big fan. All right, good. Web browser features. Set timeout is going to do nothing in JavaScript. Instead, it's going to spin up a web browser feature. Feature. But which one? Does anyone know what the feature is called? Timer. Brilliant. Time. You're gifted. There it is. Timer. There. And we're going to take the information we need, which is the function that we want to have called, or the reference to the position in JavaScript's memory of the function we want to have called again, and the important property being the thousand milliseconds. And down in the web browser, oh, down in the web browser, we are going to spin up our timer with a thousand milliseconds as our property. And then we're going to have a kind of condition. Is it complete? Ben, is it complete yet? No. Definitely not. Exactly. At one millisecond, it is definitely not complete. And then on completion, Ben, what are we going to want to invoke? Print hello. Print hello. Exactly. On completion, on completion, we're going to want to invoke, invoke. We're going to want to invoke, we're going to want to run, print, hello, the function. All right. Set timeout's work is now done. Its only work of interest was the work it does outside of JavaScript. Technically, in JavaScript, it returns a value representing the timer. So you could, OK, fine. But it has nothing of any interest. In JavaScript. Its only job is in the web browser to spin up this work. Meaning, we can move on from this line. This line, we can never move on from the line until we finish its work. In JavaScript, its work was trivial as nothing. So we move straight on to Alec. What is our next line of code at about two milliseconds that the JavaScript engine, we've just done set timeout, the JavaScript engine is going to execute? It's going to log me first. Exactly. Log me first. Beautiful. Me first is there. And look, people, we've, we're very, very close to being happy. We've spun up, we've got started on a task that takes a long time. Here, albeit it's a timer, with functionality you want to call at the end of it. One of the most interesting tasks, but it's a task that takes a long time. And we've continued straight on. Oh, there you go. Accelerated. No, that's, that's not a good new additional feature in my diagram. We've continued straight on in our synchronous JavaScript execution to our console log. Look at that. This is very, very nice. This is the first part. But now we're going to encounter the issue that's going to basically be our issue ongoing, which is now we have functionality that's going to hopefully come back in and be run. How? JavaScript, syn JavaScript synchronous code, like the regular code, the stuff that's top to bottom, line by line, it's done now. But, oh, let's set that call stack. We should have had a call stack up, sorry. Let's make sure our call stack's up. JavaScript synchronous code is done now. There it is. But in the background, oh, a world of stuff is happening. A little timer, it's clicking by as it goes. And at about 1,001 milliseconds, what happens? Brian? It executes the print out. Right. Is it complete at 1,001 milliseconds? Is that timer complete after a thousand milliseconds? Yes. It's complete, and so we're able to call print hello. What does it mean in terms of my call stack, Brian, to say I execute print hello? It adds it to a queue. We'll come to that in one second. What does it mean in terms of my call stack? Oh, it adds print hello to the call, call stack. Excellent, Brian. Thank you, man. It adds it to the call stack. That is to say, the thing that was happening outside of the web browser is going to send a message to say, our print hello function, get it back on the call stack. 
It's ready to call, it's ready to execute it. Back in JavaScript at about 1,001 milliseconds. So there it is. Look at that, at 1,001 milliseconds, we get our JavaScript code, our JavaScript function. The one we deferred is allowed back in. It calls print hello, which console logs hello. And folks, so this is a beautiful outcome. This is it. Our three goals were do tasks that take a long time, like deferring a function with a timer. Continue running our JavaScript code in the meantime. Oops. Oh, wrong way. Continue running our JavaScript code in the meantime. Console log, me first, continued immediately after we set up a task, set time out. It was going to take a long time. We set up long-term task, long-time task, and we continued the hell straight on two minutes, seconds later. And when our slow task, that is this countdown of the timer, completes, be able to run functionality knowing the task is done and data is ready. No data to be ready here, but we'll see in a moment what that looks like. All right. Thumbs on this concept. I want to add, there are a whole bunch of edge cases. Things where you go, huh, but what about if that happened? But what about if that happened? But I want to see some medium thumbs on clarification. But what if that happened? And we're going to see in a moment, when you interact with a world outside of this pure synchronous JavaScript engine, you're going to need to have some really strict rules for when our JavaScript uh, engine allows this deferred function functionality back in. But let's have thumbs. You lost me. I'm clear. I have clarifications. Everybody's thumbs out and proud. Michelle has one. Mike has one. Mike, let's come to you first. I just want to know how, um, how it works when you have, if you have layers. You know, you have a set timeout uh, function called that requires some more time. You lost me. I'm clear. I have clarifications. Everybody's thumbs out and proud. Michelle has one. Mike has one. Mike, let's come to you first. I just want to know how, um, how it works when you have, if you have layers. You know, you have a set timeout uh, function called that requires some more time. Hmm. Okay, so you're saying if inside of a if inside of my print hello, I would defer further functionality. So call another function, which isn't a real a function, a facade for web browser feature. Yeah. Okay, let's come to that. Michelle. Uh, my question is, what if I'm actively ex executing something on the call stack? Aha. Uh -huh. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Where's that going? Exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or suppose I have like a you know ten thousand console logs. When's the function allowed back in? Just as soon as it's ready. After five of those console logs. After a few of them. Arbitrary. What if I have a function, as you say, sitting on the call stack for maybe 300 milliseconds, or even 1,000 milliseconds? When's the, when's the print hello allowed back on? It's going to just come in randomly? Maybe. What a language design that would be. Let's just make sure we know which are our facade functions. We've got set timeout. When I say facade, I mean it's a facade. It's a front. It's a, it, looks like it's a, it looks like a JavaScript function. It is not. It looks like it's going to create an context. It does not. It's not of any meaningful to, not in any way mm -hmm. meaningful to us. Instead, it just spins up background work. It's a, A K function. You can put it this way, introduction. I mean, why what? Okay, synchronous JavaScript. If a K model, if a K function. Facade, it's a front. It's like those Westworld, oh god, those Westworld people with the face, oh. Anyone, who watches the Westworld show? You know that bit where the faces open up? Oh my god, fucking hate that. I literally, I, I, watched, the, I watched the first episodes for the first episode of the season with my fingers like this the whole way through in case, anytime I saw one of those people in case their faces opened up. And it happened, I saw a bit of it, and I haven't watched it since. I don't like the show anymore. I don't want to see the faces opening up. But this is what it's like. It's like a facade. For those of you who have not seen Westworld, it's about. Uh, pretend versions of people, or maybe not, maybe they're as real as us. Uh, but they were originally mechanically created, meaning behind the skin was mechanical stuff. Ooh. And we all know that humans find that very, very creepy. Well, that's what the set timeout's like. It's a facade for functionality outside of itself. It's not real, it's not pure JavaScript, it's pretend. There you go. I hate analogies, that's why I hate analogies. Good. So, we're interacting with a world outside of JavaScript now. We need rules. We need strict rules for how we're going to interact with it. So we're going to see this code here in order to identify a bunch of scenarios that are going to indicate what our rules must be. There we go, line by line, we're going to walk through our code. And then, by the way, we're going to get into pair programming. And then we're going to see a brand new solution that everybody loves that does not use this model. Fuck function. Line one, James, what are we doing? We're declaring a function called print hello. Excellent, good job from James. Line two, who am I not quite? Mm -hmm. 
So functions like set timeout. So function like set timeout are called facade because they have inherently inherit because they are they are they are not part of JavaScript and it has inherited mechanism you know and it has inherent mechanism outside of JavaScript it has an inherent mechanism outside of JavaScript that can communicate to to that to it Every single person from the side of Mike, line two, what are you doing? Defunction of block for one sec. <clears throat> uh, pre hello function is declare. But this function when it's called is gonna sit on the call stack for one thousand milliseconds. Mm -hmm. This is not a function that's sending work off the background. It's gonna sit there for a thousand milliseconds. Uh, Sony, can you think of a way in which I could write that function such that it did that? What could I do that would take a thousand milliseconds? Got in, in the pure JavaScript thread, it's going to be doing something very, very fast, lots of little mini tasks, very, very fast. Ben, what can you think of? Looping. Looping, exactly. Looping will do that. It's going to be little processing, very, very fast. It's going to be a big loop that lasts a thousand milliseconds in a modern JavaScript engine. Big old loop. But there is a loop long enough that would last a thousand milliseconds. You're not doing it outside of JavaScript, it's very much pure JavaScript, and therefore it's blocking us continuing our code when that function is called for a thousand milliseconds. Excellent. Uh, now, now, Mike. We're going to call set timeout mm -hmm. with the argument, the print hello function definition. We're definitely not calling it, and the argument zero. So, Mike, try to talk me through what's going to happen here, and it's going to be in terms of our web browser features, isn't it? So, what's going to happen here, Mike? <laughs> no, it's not. So, what does set timeout then set up? Uh, it's going to set up a local execution function. Is it? Um, it's going to do follow up to set function. Aha. Uh -huh. Set timeout does what does it do anything in JavaScript? It does nothing, nothing, in JavaScript. nothing Instead, in it is going to, it's a label. It's a facade function mm -hmm. for a web browser feature. Which feature, Ben? Timer. Timer. So it's going to spin up a web timer. browser feature, the feature timer. And it's going to take in the two important things it needs to know. And as a web browser, how many milliseconds, uh, Mike, is this timer going to be running for? Zero. Zero milliseconds. And so at at say one millisecond, which is when we're kicking this off, is this timer complete, Mike? It's instantly complete, exactly. And on completion, what do we want to do? We want to call print hello. We want to pass it back into JavaScript, or you know, refer to it in JavaScript and kick it off running in JavaScript. So print hello is immediately ready to run. So do we add it straight to the call stack? No. Why not? It's Why? It, no, but it's instantly ready. It's ready to go back on. But we are, we're back in JavaScript context. Look, next line is two milliseconds. Why can't this guy look, come back? We said whenever it's ready, come back on the call stack. Huh. Yeah, you're right though. The next line of code we're gonna hit at two milliseconds is block four one sec. We're not sure how it's gonna work, but we do know when we go into it, we're gonna spend how many milliseconds inside of it, Josh? Uh, milliseconds, a thousand. <laughs> a thousand, well, a thousand. Well, thousand. Josh, by the way, for his good second to millisecond adjustments. Exactly, plus a thousand milliseconds. That's gonna sit on our call stack we have global on the bottom. Block for one sec is going to sit on our call stack for a thousand milliseconds. Maybe during it, print hello is ready, ready to go. Maybe during it, it jumps on top and starts running. Does it do that? That would be a terrible language. Maybe, maybe possible. That would be certainly possible. But that would be very, very arbitrary. Very arbitrary for when our code would execute. So it definitely can't do, as Michelle said, it, can't, it definitely can't pass print hello back <coughs> on the call stack during another function execution. That looks pretty clear. Kind of sort of random arbitrary, but maybe once that function's finished executing, yeah, once that function's finished executing and we get block for one sec off the call stack and we return our thread back out at a thousand and two milliseconds, maybe now print hello is allowed back on the call stack. Who thinks it's allowed back on the call stack? I'm doing my the answer is no voice. Who thinks it's allowed back on the call stack? 
Yeah, Alec, maybe. Maybe. Unfortunately, no. Even though poor little print hello, it's been sitting there. I'm ready to run, run me. Be ready to run for, at this point, a thousand and one milliseconds from when it was first kicked off. The time was kicked off with instantly complete. Print hello was instantly ready to come back on, but it wasn't allowed back on. We'll see the exact rule why. Actually, we're gonna hit next, console log. Me, good old me first. If it says me first, you know it's gonna console log it first. There it is, me first, at a thousand and two milliseconds. Okay, now do we think at this point, as we finish all of our global code, do we think now print hello is allowed back on? Print hello is now allowed back on. But how does it get back on? It turns out that we need two more pieces to our puzzle. We need a fundamental rule. Our fundamental rule for when deferred functionality, now yes it was only deferred by zero milliseconds, but it was still thrown out of JavaScript and associated with a web browser, it was thrown out of JavaScript. We need a rule for when that thing that's been thrown out of JavaScript is allowed back into JavaScript. And we have one simple rule. I must have finished emptying my call stack of any functionality to be run and finished running all my global synchronous code. All my code, I could have a thousand console logs. It's kind of crazy. I could have, I could have spun up this deferred functionality inside a function call, come out of it, have a thousand, console, I could have a while loop that's infinite with console logs in and I'll never allow print hello back on the call stack. It's never allowed back in. Why? Because when I fin mm Mm-hmm. <clears throat> my background features work, print hello does not go straight to the call stack. As Brian was hinting, it goes to something called a queue. It gets queued up as a callback, I guess. It's, a it's because of this. Mm -hmm. Functions like set terminals are called facade because they are not part of JavaScript and it has an inherent mechanism. Uh, because they are not part of JavaScript and it has an inherent mechanism outside of JavaScript that can communicate to it. That mechanism is called the callback queue. That mechanism is the callback queue. Has a few names, uh, the task queue, we even call it the macro task queue at the moment, but the callback queue is a queue of functions that are ready to come on the call stack. There it is, print hello, blessing approximately what millisecond was print hello added to the callback queue? One millisecond. And approximately one millisecond, exactly. There it is, one millisecond. And then we had our rule. When is this function allowed back into JavaScript? It's allowed back into JavaScript only when the call stack is empty and all our global code is finished running. And that rule, or the checking of that rule, has a posh name. It's a little sort of process, it's a metaphorical process, the whole process is looping and checking really fast. Is the call stack empty? Is all the global code finished running? Is the queue got anything in it? Is the call stack empty? Queue got anything in it? And that
Mm -hmm. the, that mechanism is called by Q. So how this mechanism communicate with the JavaScript world? So what are exactly how how does this mechanism communicate with <clears throat> the JavaScript world? What are the series of of steps to do that? <clears throat> so that is known as the event loop. Its job is to say, is the call second? You finish writing all this stuff? Is the global code finished executing? Is something like, oh, there is. This was not empty for a long time. At this point, the event loop's going, uh uh uh, no, no, no. We can't add anything onto the call stack because it's got blocked one second. Oh, but even then, console log's sitting there ready to be run. Ready to be run in the global execution context. Aha. At this moment, the event loop goes, is the call stack empty? Yes, it is. The callback shows something in it. So print hello. You are finally. Exactly. So, what are the series of steps to do that? Okay. The callback queue. Okay, the callback queue. So after, so after, or uh, when, when the JavaScript stack. So if the JavaScript stack, exactly, if the JavaScript stack has evaluated all JavaScript functions, in other words, when the call stack is empty, now this is the mechanism that allows to communicate the outside world with JavaScript. Now, now, and so now we can pass whatever we add. Mm -hmm. This mechanism is called the callback queue, which allows to store functions run by timers and add them to the callback queue. Mm -hmm. Which allowed to which allowed to add which allowed to add functions 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 run by timers and add it to the callback queue. So how this mechanism communicate with the JavaScript world? Okay, because so far we know how this go outside of that. But how now it get in here? Okay. But so we know how this functions go outside of outside of JavaScript. So we know how these functions go go we know how these functions go outside of JavaScript through the callback queue. Especially if you're using timers. Okay. Or timers functions are called facade. So now that we know how these functions get out of JavaScript as a way to run tasks uh, that might take time, uh, now how we know how those functions are done. So now how can we, after a period of time, we can know how these functions are available so we can execute it. Okay. So how yeah, so now how this mechanism communicate to JavaScript? How this function, <coughs> mm -hmm. how this function, yeah, how this functions 
communicate back to JavaScript. What are the series of steps to do that? If the JavaScript stack has evaluated all the JavaScript functions, in other words, in the word, when the call stack is empty, now we can pass uh, whatever we whatever we got. So now we can pass uh, the first element, exactly the first element. Uh, of our callback queue now we can pass the first element of our callback queue put it put it into the call stack <clears throat> And they evaluate. A thousand and one milliseconds after you were deferred for zero milliseconds, you are finally allowed back onto the call stack at a thousand and three milliseconds. And note these timings are ordinal. They're not, I mean, they're, they're ordinal uh, besides the cardinal ones. There you go. Ordinal meaning it's about the ordering of them. At a thousand and three milliseconds, finally, print hello is allowed back on our call stack. Now we can pass the and now we can pass the first element of our callback queue, put into the call stack, and evaluate it. But who, who is checking that the call stack is empty? The event loop. <laughs> And at a thousand and three milliseconds, we print. Exactly, but who is checking that the call stack is empty to add task from the callback queue? The event loop. <coughs> there it is, people. A beautiful process of deferring our functionality to then only be allowed back into JavaScript under a certain condition. That condition is checked for by this event loop that's checking it, looping very fast. That is metaphorical, but it's looping very fast to check this condition. Is the callback queue, does it have something in it? It does allow it back on when our call stack is entirely empty and our global execution context has finished running all of its code. And that's it. These six parts are the core of our asynchronous model of JavaScript. Our solution three is going to show us that JavaScript recently introduced two new additional parts to this model. We're going to see them in solution three. But for now, thumbs on this core six parts. Memory, thread of execution, call stack, representing our execution context, our web browser features, our callback queue, where when our web browser feature finishes its work is where our function is going to be sent that was deferred by our facade function that spun up that web browser feature timer. And finally, our event loop that checks that callback queue, it says something in there, is our call stack good and empty? with no global code to run, and says, OK, you're allowed back on. Everybody's thumbs out. I have a clarification. Unsurprisingly clear, you lost me. All right, Vic has a clarification. Brian has one. Paul has one. Michelle has one. Mike, Mike, why don't you kick us off? James has one. Mike, why don't you kick us off? I'm just wondering where the callback queue is that yeah, stored in the, in the web browser feature. That's, in the, that's a JavaScript feature. That's a JavaScript mm -hmm. feature. That's a JavaScript feature. feature. Mm -hmm. That's a JavaScript, mm -hmm. feature. That's a JavaScript uh, feature. All right, how does it prioritize those like if you had more than one set timeout and they all mm -hmm. were you know going up in from zero to ten or something like that would it how would it so as soon as they complete they're sent here if they complete at the same time eh, it's too subtle to I don't know if they complete at the same time oh that's uh the scenario is improbable Alec is that a stack then the callback queue it's a queue okay but it's a queue in the sense that it's we we uh, pass in print hello if they have this in, in, in a particular mechanism and they don't specify her hard questions. So even though that we are on the hard parts, what about those hard questions? If we were to complete another web browser feature, it's cute. Okay, but oh, that's, uh, the scenario is improbable. Alec? Is that a stack then? The callback queue? It's cute. Okay, but it's a queue in the sense that it's, we, we uh, pass in print hello. If we were to complete another web browser feature and it, its web browser feature can be last with pass, it's going to be queued up behind to start next. Okay, so it's a first in, first out. So the queue structure. Mm -hmm. First in, first out.
first out with a Q structure. Exactly. First in. Exactly, first in. First in, first out. No, no, condescend no condescending giggles. Alec asked a very legitimate question whether the word Q was stack. A very legitimate question. All right. Uh, who else had a question? Victor was next. Let's hold on to the end we'll do the word Q was stack. A very legitimate question. All right. Uh, who else had a question? Victor was next. Let's hold on to the end we'll do, yeah, it's a very interesting one. But think of it as doing something very similar in the web browser. I'll come to that one on one with you, dude. Uh, there was other clarification, kind of James? Yeah, I can't remember. Does um, does the task queue get processed at the end of the event loop or at the start of, or sorry, the event loop iteration or at the start of? Ooh, you should have do that, bro. Hmm. Hmm. In diagram. Interesting. Mm -hmm. the next iteration. Once you finish all synchronous tasks, At the end of the iteration. in that sense, yes. Let's just make sure we have any online questions we're answering. Paul, go ahead. I think I just have a question to Mike. I just want to make sure I know the set amount method that's provided by the yeah, browser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Set time. Go ahead, please, go ahead, man. So then the event loop and the callback queue aren't unique to each individual browser uh, runtime, but like say other non-browser runtime, et cetera, would also have those provided. Oh, or it's just within absolutely. How Node implements these pieces, that is somewhat up to them. So we'll come to a piece later on where Node implements it in a somewhat different way. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see that a little bit later on, dude. But that's a great, great question.
Yeah, Ben. Is there a limit to the size of the callback queue? I mean, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a limit? Uh, you know, it's like that. Those are silly questions, but it's like bad question, bro. Is there a limit to the callback queue? I assume so, but that's a really good question. I would say test it out, and we'll talk about we'll talk about because there's a limit to the call stack, of course. The callback queue. I mean, as long as don't forget the callback queue, you're not storing this function here. You're referencing its position in JavaScript memory. So your question is really, is there a limit to JavaScript memory for function definitions? Do you see? Your, your limit... Mm -hmm. It's because you have a reference here. QA. <clears throat> Does it call back Q? That's a limit. Since the callback callback queue is holding just reference, it is You're not limited by you're not copying this function in here. So to me, it's more a que the question is, is there a limit to JavaScript runtime's memory? Well, yes. You know, so since the callback queue is holding just reference, um, it is more like, uh, is, is, there a, is, there, is there is a limit of JavaScript, of JavaScript function of JavaScript functions memory so the answer the answer is yes but that's implies your callback queue whatever that limit is which is independent of callback queue does that make sense Ben okay good question then yes Michelle I'm not just whether the event loop is also part of the JavaScript engine that you referenced mm -hmm, absolutely but it's going to do even more stuff okay good question then yes Michelle I'm not just whether the event loop is also part of the JavaScript engine Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but it's going to do even more stuff than just handle this. We'll see those in a moment. Sean, so that the event loop is also part of the JavaScript engine. Exactly. So the JavaScript, uh, the event loop, is part of the JavaScript engine. It is. Whatever that limit is, which is independent of callback queue. Does that make sense, Ben? Okay, good question. Then. Yes, Michelle. I'm not just whether the event loop is also part of the JavaScript engine. That you reference limit is, which is independent of callback queue. Does that make sense, Ben? Okay, good question. Then. Yes, Michelle. I'm not just whether the event loop is also part of the JavaScript engine. That you reference. Mm -hmm, absolutely. But mm -hmm. event loop part is the event loop part of the JavaScript engine. Yes, it, yes, it is. But it's going to do even more stuff than just handle this. We'll see those in a moment. Exactly. It handles more things that we have saw right now. <clears throat> Sean? What happens when you pass an anonymous function to the set timeout? Uh, anonymous functions, you can almost think of them being stored in memory as like unlabeled functions. But they still have a position and address in memory. Think of we're not passing the label to the function really. Under the hood, what we're passing is a reference to a particular position in memory. Uh, and so, if we don't have a label for print hello, we pass a function in directly. That function is still being defined in global memory. When I just when I uh, run set timeout and pass a function in, not a labeled function, but when I define right there in my uh, parentheses, that is still being stored in global memory. It's not a label, and it's that referenced function that's eventually being referenced here. This doesn't have a label now, but it's still referencing the position in JavaScript global memory where that function was defined. Function and so if we don't have a label for print hello, we're not passing the anonymous functions. You can almost think of them being stored. Let's handle this, or we'll see those in a moment. Sean, what happens when you pass an anonymous function to the set timeout? Uh, anonymous functions. You can almost think of them being stored in memory as like unlabeled functions. But they how do we exactly? So what happens if we pass anonymous? Anony, anon. 
functions to set timeout to timers they are just reference to unlabeled functions in memory that are passed down exactly because after all we are not we are passing as a reference here to be intelligent here we're passing as a reference to that mm -hmm. that are passed down to the callback queue Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You still have a position and address in memory. Mm -hmm. Think of, we're not passing the label to the function, really. Under the hood, what we're passing is a reference to a particular position in memory. Uh, and so if we don't have a label for print hello, we pass the function in. They're just reference to unlabeled functions in memory that are passed down to the callback here. So we are, so we are passing is pointers to the exactly we are passing is pointer uh we are passing is address memory here label to the function really under the hood what we're passing is a reference to a particular position in memory mm -hmm. we are passing is under the hood reference to a particularly Reference to a particular address in memory. A link to that. Uh, and so if we don't have a label for print hello, we pass a function in directly. That function is still being defined in global memory. When I, def when I uh, run set timeout and pass a function in, not a labeled function, but when I define right there in my uh, parentheses, that is still being stored in global memory. It's not a label. And it's that reference function that's eventually being referenced here. This doesn't have a label now but it's still referencing the position in JavaScript global memory where that mm -hmm. function was defined. Make sense? Good question. Oh, before we do that, one of the problems with this, no problems. There's a beautiful, intuitive approach once you understand on the hood how it's working. Our response data is only available in the callback function. We don't see this here, we're gonna see in a moment. Uh, any data that comes back from my web browser features work, for example, I go and get some tweets from Twitter, they're going to be passed as the argument to the function that was set up to run on completion. That can get pretty complex because the data is only going to be available inside of here. That can get pretty messy. And maybe it feels odd to think of passing a function into another function only for it to run much later. Maybe it feels odd. It definitely feels odd. When I see that set timeout print hello zero, everything tells me that I must be running print hello somehow inside set timeout. Everything tells me that, especially that says zero milliseconds. And yet I am absolutely not. I'm passing a function definition in only for it to be invoked beyond my control much later in my application. That losing control of our execution and defining something print hello separately that's going to arbitrarily well not arbitrarily but beyond that control going to be called late when we write code we kind of think of it somewhat at least of being i'm taking control of the structure of my code but instead i'm leaving a whole piece to be run beyond my control later on that is a weird feeling i'll say this once you understand under the hood how it's working it's actually not too bad if you don't understand under the hood how it's working it's horrible but if you understand under the hood how it's working you know that this is a pretend function in javascript it's a facade it's a facade function, function. you know mm -hmm. this function is going to be passed into a queue and then allowed back into javascript Yes, beyond your control, but that's the whole nature of asynchronous programming. You do a single thread of sending off tasks, and you bring them back in automatically, ready to, ready to be um, used in functionality, or their return values, or their response values, ready to be used in functionality that you set up earlier to be called later on. Uh, you get that that is the very model of asynchronous uh, input-output uh, architectures. Uh, you get that that's the design. But it's still, I understand it's unintuitive. Uh, benefits, super explicit, once you understand how it works under the hood. The function you pass. Exactly, so what are the problems with this? problem you know so problems with this approach with callback queue it makes not only our code verbose and hard to read which is roughly roughly 90 percent of our job as a software developer software engineering 
okay <clears throat> benefits you know benefits uh, super explosive when you understand how it works under the hood exactly super explicit when you understand it under the hood pass in is going to be auto triggered <coughs> from the web browser features completion back into javascript and then be called when the web browser finishes work or web browser feature finishes work so pair programming there is no better way to grow as a software engineer the reason being we said at the start as people shared resources like mm -hmm. i created a function before i have it in css style before uh, I know what a variable is. Yes, I have created a function before. Yes, I have added CSS style before. Yes, I have implemented a sort of algorithm, a uh, bubble merge. Uh, yes, uh, especially um, binary sort. Sort of, sort of. Yeah, binary source. When you split your array, uh, uh, this is when this is an assorted array. <laughs> so if your if your array is sorted. Um, you first need to sort that array, which is time, computational uh, time, which is computationally expensive. And when we talk about computational expensive is that it takes time. And that is what, as a software engineer, time is the most important asset that you have, as for any people in life. But in any case, um, I can add a method to an object's proper prototype. Yes, I know how to do that. Uh, I understand the event loop in JavaScript. Partially, I understand callback functions. Yes, I do. Uh, I implement filter from scratch. I have handle collision in hash tables. Yes. This one is like, mm-hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. This is pair programming. The best way to learn and improve as a software engineering is by coding along with other developer known as the uh, driver in the driver and the plural site for sure etc that plural site that is video driven that these resources are solid they're excellent well i don't love plural site as much as front end masters one of the best resources for videos probably the best by a long way through it by, cl by clearly the best uh, but those are only legit if you're using them wielding them to solve problems you're getting in your day-to-day -day work so if you're an aspiring engineer and you're not working on tough JavaScript problems every day, then you fall into the trap of what I call easy learning. Easy learning is learning where you don't hit blocks and therefore you don't grow. So how do you do what I call hard learning that's effective that actually is what makes you grow as an engineer? Well, you do things like tough coding challenges. You build projects, you have assignments. But the problem with those is it's super tempting to do what? To do anything else besides that. Including, so we might be making a cup of tea, whatever. But even if it's not that, even if you're the person like, no, no, I can actually push through them you may still fall into two traps. I call it the, the researcher versus the stack overflower. Mm -hmm. So this is the mm -hmm. researcher. That's my magnifying glass. I need to spell that out, unfortunately, because clearly I've been told nobody ever recognizes mm -hmm. what the symbol is. And a stack overflower. Ideally, as a software engineer, we're always balancing these two extremes. I want to understand everything, how it's working, but I simultaneously got to make it work sometimes. Just make it work without understanding every piece. We're always balancing these two needs. As a pro engineer facing tough challenges, we hopefully learn to balance that effectively. But we can always get better at it. And the best way I know to get the balance right is pair programming. So known as the driver and the compiler. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to, because we tend to, because, because we, software engineers, 
can be or can be in one of these two sides. These so are the researcher, the researcher, okay, the researcher versus this type of flow. We hope you learn and simultaneously got to make it work sometimes. Just make it work. Ideally, as a software engineer, we're always balancing these two extremes. Clearly, I've been told nobody ever recognizes what this symbol is. And a stack overflower. Exactly. Researcher versus stack overflow. So the whole, the idea here is to find the right balance. And that is thanks to pair programming. Ideally, as a software engineer, we're always balancing these two extremes. I want to understand everything, how it's working, but I simultaneously got to make it work. So the idea is to find the right balance between between exactly. I want to know how this thing works and I want to make it work. I want to make it work. And that's where and that's where pair programming uh, is vital. Sometimes just make it work without understanding every piece. We're always balancing these two needs. As a pro engineer facing tough challenges, we hopefully learn to balance that effectively. But we can always get better at it, and the best way I know to get the balance right is pair programming. Pair programming, by separating the concerns, on the one side we have James, on the other side we have Blessing, James and Blessing working through a challenge together, so say Blessing is what's called our navigator and James is our driver, Blessing is at no point ever allowed to type. She's not allowed to put her hands on the keyboard, but she is responsible for the problem solving of the challenge. That is to say, Blessing is the one who is going to verbalize and approach both an overall strategy and the line-by-line -line execution of the code that James is then going to interpret into actual code. She is never going to take control of the keyboard. He's never just going to say, oh, James, you mind if I just show you what I mean? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Instead, this separation of concerns is going to ensure that Blessing can't ever become a researcher for 10 hours, reading every last thing about the new keyword, because she's got James sitting there waiting. But nor can she just be a stack overflow, make it work, plug and play script person, because James needs to know a bit more about why we're doing it. Like, what is our strategy here? What are we doing line-by-line? -line? But also by her not being allowed to say, James, let me just show you, her technical communication, the ability for her to explicate her approach and make it meaningful mm -hmm. to somebody else is vital. It is vital, mate. It is vital. So the role of the navigator <coughs> is to um, know what is the approach and verbalize that so the driver okay so the role of the navigator is to know what is the approach and verbalize so the driver uh, knows what to implement the navigator improve mm -hmm. <clears throat> the navigator improve it is ability okay the navigator improve it is ability to communicate it effectively okay so the navigator improves the ability to communicate it effectively while the driver to implement and understand why we are um, to implement and understand what we are we are doing. And I really think I really love this approach. It's a thing we look for in Cosmin interviews more than ever. We've turned out many people for Cosmin who've been jobs with engineers for four or five years because their technical communication is not there. And yet that is what we see as developer. Mid-level developer, take any feature implement it, even though they've never seen the concept before, because they've learned how to break through blocks. Senior developer can take any feature and they can empower a team, their colleagues, to implement it for, because they've learned how to break through blocks. And yet that is what makes a senior developer. Mid-level developer, 
take any feature, implement it. Mm -hmm. Mid-level um, engineering, take any feature and implement because they can now break into the code to the code senior developers senior engineering can take any features and impact mm -hmm. so you know it is part of the how to become a business consulting freelancer which is after all that's exactly where we are doing and there are several roles involved here. <clears throat> Senior engineers can take any feature and impact a team. They've never, never seen the concept before because they've learned how to there. And yet that is what makes a senior developer. Mid-level developer, take any feature, implement it. Even they've never seen the concept before. Mm -hmm. Even if they even if they haven't seen, haven't seen, yeah, even if they haven't seen that code before, because they can, because they can know, because they can break into the code. Because they've learned how to break the blocks. Because they learn, because they learn how to break Wait, what? Because they've learned how to break through blocks. Because they have to learn how to break through blocks. Senior developer can take any feature and they can empower a team. Senior engineers can take a feature and, and, and empower a team. Their colleagues to implement it and empower a team, their college, to implement that. Again, you only go, f if you're gonna go faster, okay, if you're gonna go faster, go alone. If you're gonna go f further, uh, go with others. Because their ability to take their internal mental model of the code and make it meaningful to somebody else. Mm-hmm their ability to take their inner mental model and make it meaning meaningful meaningful to others yep and make it meaningful to others and that's one of the reasons why they're looking is for a senior developer that is what we're training on when we pair program all right, which means one machine between two. Uh, it means switching over role every 10 minutes or so. It means, by the way, if your partner's going down a path you think's a mistake, let it get to the point where they press run and they see the error and then debug it together. Don't say, ah, I think you're in the wrong way here. Very, very effective. All right, people, there it is. You're gonna go to csbin. That's right. There you go. I think this is the same. Mm, no, I, oh, this is quite different. Hard part, promise. Oh, this is an iterators. Iterators, promise. And promise. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, but there's no... Okay. Mm -hmm. .io, this is for our online folk as well. We're going to csbn.io slash promises. Get to it, start working through. This is now the examples here and the solutions. 
that you get it. Exercise and solutions. There you get it. So exercise and solutions. And they're adding a quite more challenge here, like the D bombs and the kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We also have is this. Exercise in solutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> mm -hmm. So, okay. I think that'll be good as a way to organize this thing a little bit. Uh, and quite frankly, is also very, very refreshing. Totally, totally, of course, it was very, very, very refreshing. Um, so yeah, uh, and then, well, uh, that'll be all for this video. Take care, bye-bye.